Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with two very special guests. Our first guest today is Robert Boyers, and he's here to share with us his new book, The Tyranny of Virtue, Identity, the Academy, and the Hunt for Political Heresy. Now, Robert is a professor of English at Skidmore College and a director of the New York State Summer Writers Institute. He's the author of 10 previous books and the editor of dozens of others. He often writes for such magazines as Harper's, The New Republic, The Nation, Yale Review, and many more. So let's welcome to the show, Robert Boyers. Thank you so much. What an honor it is to have you here. My goodness, your book is making some huge waves. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been getting some substantial attention over the last few weeks, and uh, uh, I'm grateful for that. Well, congratulations. I know writing a book is such a journey, especially, I mean, your book really kind of touches on some very, um, I think, important topics that we need to look at. Yeah, I think so. I I uh, I I've been uh, I wrote it over the course of the last 3 or 4 years and uh and uh they were things, you know, that I've been thinking about for quite a while and and uh, of course many of them as you know uh, bear upon uh the life of colleges and universities and so on and uh the relationship between what goes on there and and what's going on in the larger culture and uh, of course I have a of a sort of a privileged access to to that that kind of experience because I've been a uh, a teacher at a liberal arts college for 51 years and um, I travel all around the country uh, lecturing and speaking at different places and so I've had a chance to meet many people and talk about all of this and reflect and that's what the book really uh, I think demonstrates. Was that the inspiration behind writing this book? Is just your experience over all these years? Uh, that was a large part of it, you know. I, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I have uh, a variety of, of, in some cases, contradictory impressions of many things. I talk to different people. I hear things uh, from some of them that uh, that that contradict the, what I hear from others. And of course, uh, I have my own eyes and my own ears, my own impressions. And uh, and I decided I want to write this book in order to work my way through all of my doubts, misgivings, and uh, those contradictory impressions. And so, in some ways, I thought of it as an opportunity to conduct an extended conversation. Um, I think parts of it read like a conversation with myself. Uh, and that's very much what I wanted. But I also conduct conversations with lots of other people. I tell many stories in the book, many anecdotes. Some of the conversations I conduct are, are conducted with my own three um, very grown-up sons who, who also have um, different views of, of many of the questions that are raised in the book. And, uh, and, and so I think um, that's, that's a sort of important component of the book. Um, and I, you know, and, and I've, now, now, now that the book's been out for a few weeks, uh, I've heard from many people all over the country and um, and I know that it's hit a nerve with many of them, and uh, and that's been gratifying to hear. Well, what a great place to be in that you have the perspective of so many different people and your own that you can draw into this experience and have this kind of discussion. Yeah, that's been uh, that that's been a great um, advantage, a great benefit um, going forward. Um, and I um, early on, when I first uh, began to write the uh, the uh, initial chapters that eventually, when expanded and revised, became parts of the book, um, I, I published them in in some very uh, important uh, magazines. I published a couple of the early uh, chapters in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, and uh, the response to those articles was I- enormous. Uh, I heard from hundreds and hundreds of people, and um, a lot of what I heard was 
was rather uh, strange. Uh, I, I had letters, of course, there were online letters that were posted um, in response to those those pieces. Um, but I had many, many letters from academic deans and even college and university presidents who wrote me private uh, letters, um, some of them email, some of them standard letters. And uh, they just said, if you think what's going on at your own institution, uh, as you report in these pieces, is bad. Uh, I can tell you it's not um, anywhere near as as bad and disturbing as what's going on on my uh, campus. And, um, and and when I got that initial response to those first pieces, uh, I began to think I really have to um, develop this into a full scale book. Well, you start off your book talking about privilege for beginners, and I'd love for you to share with our listeners about privilege and its evolution over the years. Well, sure. Um, you know, pr- privilege uh, is is a term um, that's been in common use for a very long time. Uh, at one level, we all know, I think, exactly what it means, and we know that it means something real. Um, we know that privilege exists, that some people have uh, advantages um, that are quite extraordinary, which are not shared um, by many other people. Um, and uh, and sometimes we know the privileges that people enjoy uh, are earned. Um, at other points, we know they're unearned. Um, and we know that some people struggle um, considerably because they don't have um, privileges of any kind. Um, we know we, we often hear the expression uh, uneven playing field, and we know there is an uneven playing field. We know that some families can afford to buy privileges for their children which other families can't buy. We know that people have opportunities to move into neighborhoods that are desirable, and other people do not have the privilege to do so, either because they don't have the money or because there is bias um, in the process uh, determining uh, what kinds of neighborhoods they, they can live in or move into. I mean, all of those things, I think, are fairly commonplace, um, but they're real. Uh, and they're important. And 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 people um, on my side of the political aisle who are, let us say, left liberals, uh, are interested, invested in attempting to even the playing field and 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 to uh, to accord privileges to people who who don't have them. So that again, that that's not terribly controversial. Of course, how you go about achieving that that may be more controversial more debatable. Um, But what's happened in recent years is that privilege, the very term, the concept of privilege, has been weaponized and used indiscriminately to bash uh, whole groups of people um, without any kind of nuance or understanding. And that's one of the reasons I I wrote my chapter uh, on privilege. Um, And I myself have not had Truthfully, in, in my long life, in my long career, I've not had any problem. Nobody's ever, you know, uh, uh, given me a hard time about a so-called privilege. But I think about myself when I hear people deploy a term like white privilege in an indiscriminate way. And I think, wait a second, um, white people are not a unitary group in the society. Um, white people do not enjoy privilege in the same way as other white people. Um, and again, this, this seems to me ought to be obvious, but it isn't obvious. So when I hear sentences beginning uh, with the words, white, privilege, white people always enjoy the, or white people can be counted upon to think that I become um, very unhappy, and I begin to think that the people who are using the language in that way uh, really don't know what they're talking about. Right? There are white people and white people. Um, uh, and uh, exactly in the same way, I would respond if somebody said, oh, well, you know, he's black, and he can therefore be expected to, um, or he's gay, and he can therefore be expected to. In each of these cases, it seems to me, um, one one has to stop and think much more carefully about one is saying what one is saying. So, um, you know, at, at my New York State Summer Writers Institute, which I founded uh, 35 years ago, I had a young man um, 
come to me towards the end of the program. He was enrolled in, in a poetry class, um, and uh, and he told me that in his class um, he had um, he had um, shown a few poems that he'd written um, out of his experience as a uh, volunteer over the previous year at Brian Stevenson's uh, Slavery Museum in Alabama, and uh, and in, in those poems he he tried to get inside the experience of people that uh, he had. Had, uh, encountered there at the museum and in his readings uh, of material at the museum. And he was attacked, rather viciously attacked, for having, one, dared to appropriate the experiences of people unlike himself. Um, that word appropriation now a buzzword um, in the culture, and most especially in academic culture. And he'd been attacked for the privilege that he enjoyed as a white person who could afford to take off an entire year uh, from his college experience and travel out to this place in Alabama where he worked for nothing um, as a volunteer um, because of his convictions and his feelings about Brian Stevenson and the great work Brian Stevenson do, had done. So again, the notion that privilege can be deployed in this way as a weapon to shame people, not for anything, any bad thing that they've done, but simply on the ground that they are, for example, in this case, white, uh, or in this case, had the resources to do the thing, the family resource to do the thing that he wished to do, and a good thing it was, that seemed to me deplorable. And uh, and so I, I began to think of it as a kind of a uh, the privilege as as the the heart of a of a polite bigotry uh, that makes it acceptable to target uh, groups or persons not because of what they've done but for what they are. In this case um, that I'm speaking of, what they are is white. Nothing more than that. Um, so for a while, of course, it was, you know, we're thinking about the word privilege, good to focus on the hypocrisies and inequity, inequities uh, out there in the culture. But again, there's been a turn um, in the way that privilege is, is customarily deployed. And uh, I wanted to try to do something about that. Well, I think everything starts with a conversation, and it's easy to understand why that this conversation needs to, to take place now, because it seems like it's gone a little bit too over the edge. Well, yeah, that's uh, that's been you know my feeling, and uh, and and I've I've tried to, to to sort of call these things that are unfolding by their rightful names, uh, and to try to uh, sort of help people to recognize that uh, the views, the principles that they're avowing, the terms that they're customarily invoking, have not been carefully and scrupulously considered in terms of what they actually mean um, and what kinds of consequences they uh, can have, and I think that's uh, that's been a sort of sort of an important thing. I, you know, there there's been a lot of attention paid in the culture um, over the course of the last several years um, to the idea that what we need to do everywhere, but most especially on college and university campuses, is to create so-called safe spaces. Um, that's that's become uh, a buzzword, and people are 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 real up in arms about that. Um, they want everything to be a safe space. They want the classroom to be a safe space. Um, what is a safe space? Well, it's a space in which um, no one can no one's feelings can be hurt, in which no one can be made uncomfortable. Um, in which no one could conceivably uh, speak an offensive word or sentence, in which a potentially offensive book cannot be taught or studied. And so when you begin to think about uh, the consequences of that, um, you begin to, I think, acknowledge that what you're getting is the uh, establishment of a kind of a, a minefield in which people have to be extraordinarily careful not to sort of step on a mine and blow things up, not to cause people to call them out um, and to criticize them uh, and to call them names for having uh, offended them or hurt their feelings. So, of course, when you 
when you hear about this at one level, you think, well, okay, I mean, who wouldn't want to create uh, a comfortable and civilized space in which people uh, feel more or less comfortable speaking their minds? Well, sure, that's what we want. That's what I want uh, in my own classroom. Uh, I don't want to allow uh, people to feel that they can say just anything um, and gratuitously utter slurs about the ethnicity of other people in the room. Uh, I don't even want a student in, in a work workshop to be able to say uh, that, uh, that the story that one of the other students has turned in is stupid. No, we don't say if that how it comes up. I want to say, no, we don't, we don't call one another stupid. We don't refer to the work we turn in as stupid. We, we have other ways of, of being critical. So, you know, I'm not a, a free speech absolutist, um, but uh, and, and I do believe that it's a good idea to try to maintain a civil discourse and, and to keep the space um, as civilized as we can possibly make it. But when you think about safe spaces in the other way that I began to describe a few minutes ago, you see that in itself, it's really a hopeless proposition. Um, you can't um, in advance, determine um, everything that people will say. You can't uh, determine um, whether or not people will find a book that they're reading uncomfortable. You can't know that a poem that a student has written about sexual abuse will trigger unwanted feelings in a student in the class who has herself or himself him, himself um, suffered sexual abuse. There's no way of ensuring that. In the same way, when you think about uh, public events, um, you know you can't be sure that some people in an audience uh, won't be upset uh, by what they hear. Recently, we had an incident in which. Uh, a writer um, at a large public event read a text um, that he had written, and in it, the N-word um, was read out. And people um, were up in arms and complained. Now, I, I, I'm fully... Um, I'm fully sympathetic to the idea that just hearing the N-word read out in a public space... Um, in, a, in a text spoken not by the author, but by the character that the author has written, may make someone feel very uncomfortable. I, I understand that. But in the aftermath of this event, uh, where there were lots of complaints and so on, numbers of students came to me as director of the program and demanded that I send out a notice vowing that this sort of thing could never happen again, that we would simply not tolerate it. And uh, I responded by saying that sympathetic though I was to their feelings, um, there was no way I could make such a promise. No way uh, I could vow that such things would never happen again. I said, you're basically asking me to set myself up uh, as a censor um, who will be vetting in advance everything that people read in an auditorium, every story or poem that a person turns in in a workshop. I can't do that, nor do I want to do that. I don't want to set myself up as a censor. The response to this among large numbers of people, and I'm talking about very, very bright, in some cases brilliant people, um, including, by the way, a couple of members of my own writing faculty, the response was, well, well not censorship. Um, I, don't, I don't believe in censorship. I, I don't want to have us censor things. I said, really? Well, um, isn't that what you're demanding of me? You're telling me to vow that in advance that none, none of this could ever happen again? I mean, how would that be um, unless I set myself up as a censor? So the problem here, again, has not only to do with censorship and the demand for safe spaces, but it really has to do with the unwillingness to think through uh, the meaning and the consequence of various ideas and principles that people comfortably avow. Within the bubble, uh, the left liberal bubble, which I occupy as a left liberal, where I've spent my career, in fact, there are just certain views that have come to be held which are not understood, which are not interrogated, and they lead to um, eruptions which are most unfortunate. 
Well, thank you for going into detail on that. I think it's important for our listeners to hear just what the environment is like now and how is it for the professors you know you talked about dealing with the situation where the student wrote you is is there a common thing that you are supposed to say um, according to you know the different colleges and campuses well yes and that that's that's one of the things that I uh, that I talk about um, in the book um, and and really it has to do with the creation uh, on campus of what I call uh, a total culture, um, and a, a total culture, you know, it's the, the words themselves are not obscure, uh, but the concept is perhaps uh, something that needs to be sort of looked at a little bit. You know, we think of, uh, if we, we go to an extreme, and we think about uh, totalitarian societies, uh, the societies we associate with mm, the Soviet Union, uh, one of the fascist countries um, in the period of the 1930s and 40s, we think of totalitarian societies as indeed total cultures in which every aspect of life was placed under surveillance and where there were severe penalties um, up to the point of death, right, for violating uh, protocols, standards, expectations that were held. Now, thank God we're not there. Um, no one, I'm not claiming that we are a totalitarian country or that the campus is a totalitarian sitting, setting. But I am saying that increasingly the uh, campus um, is mobilized in such a way as to feel like a total culture. What does that mean? Well, it means, for example, that um, every year um, professors are required um, to attend um, consciousness raising settings, uh, meetings uh, with lawyers and human resources uh, people um, to talk about things that they say or to say or not to say. It means that professors once a year have actual online tests administered to them, tests that take uh, a few hours to complete, um, in which you uh, demonstrate that you know exactly the right thing to say when, for example, a student asks you a certain kind of question, or where a colleague um, asks you a certain question, or approaches you in a certain way. You ought to understand that even things that seem uh, rather benign are actually um, susceptible to being misunderstood and thus should never be spoken. Um, you're never to ask your new uh, Asian American colleague where her family came from uh, because that may make her uncomfortable uh, in some way. And so uh, basically um, colleges and universities have, have set up these protocols um, uh, so as to protect themselves against a uh, legal challenge of any kind. Uh, I think we've all heard about Title IX, um, which, which is a sort of a government, uh, a new government orthodoxy, uh, which re requires that people um, confirm that they're on board with all of these rules and expectations. In the same way, um, on colleges and university campuses, the uh, opening events of the year, um, sometimes called convocation, are always built around uh, a consciousness-raising text uh, in which uh, students are introduced to um, expectations uh, which, which, which they are to follow and observe through the course of their college uh, careers uh, all through the week. Uh, and I really mean all through the week, pretty much every day, uh, our email screens are filled um, with notices of events, many of which uh, are not uh, educational events at all, uh, but which are events designed to help people to know what is correct and what is not correct. And that's what I mean by the creation of a total culture. Um, in, in many colleges and universities, um, uh, faculty members are required to turn in their uh, syllabi in advance so that um, the human resources department can ensure uh, that the texts that are required of students uh, are not in any way 
dangerous and uh, don't represent a violation of college or university policy. Now, again, there are various ways to uh, to sort of interpret these kinds of things uh, in a beneficent way. You can say, well, of course, colleges are protecting themselves against legal challenge. That's okay, uh, legitimate. Um, and you can say that people really do have deep convictions about what is and is not to be done. But at the same time, um, you you can understand that when you put all of these different things I've just described together, along with many other such things, you do increasingly have the sense that you are are living in a surveillance culture in which everything is being watched, um, in which everything is being assessed in accordance with certain strict rules and principles. And that feels to me like a dramatic change from the university environment that um, that I once knew. Now, of course, you can say I'm an old guy and I've been around a long time and I'm simply uh, nostalgic for the old ways. I, I'm not nostalgic for the old ways. Um, I had trouble with lots of things um, that, uh, that I observed on the campus years ago and I, I wrote about them um, uh, in those years. Um, but uh, still, the change to what I'm calling a total culture, has been dramatic. It's taken place steadily over the years. In the last decade or so, it's assumed proportions that seem to me quite astonishing and disturbing. What is one thing that you want readers to take away from your book? Well, if there's one thing, uh, I, I, I will honestly say it has to do with, uh, with the, the, the tenor of the book. Um, the voice in the book, the fact that the book does not um, come down strongly on behalf of uh, many of the uh, principles that it enunciates. I want people to take away from the book that it's possible to talk about and think about really difficult and controversial matters uh, like a human being, um, uh, like what we call in, uh, in my Jewish tribe, a mensch, uh, a decent person who's open to many different points of view, who's willing to test his own views, who tells stories about people um, in order to, to find out what they think and what they say and to try to understand where they're coming from. And that uh, the voice of the book is personal and often affectionate um, and often funny. I want people to take that away from the book instead of um, thinking about it as one of those books that's simply written out of anger and bitterness and vengefulness. And uh, my book is anything but that. Well, your book is so well written. I really enjoyed reading it. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community? Well, I, I, I'm one of those strange people um, who welcomes um, uh, emails. I'm, I'm an email guy, and really, uh, if anybody wants to write to me, um, they can write to me at my email, which is rboyers, R-B-O-Y-E-R-S, at skidmore.edu, skidmore, S-K-I-D-M-O-R-E, dot edu. Uh, I've been a professor at Skidmore for 51 years. I'm still a full-time professor. I'm about to turn 77. I am healthy, well, vigorous, and although I'm traveling all around the country these days giving talks and lectures around the book, I'm very responsive on email. I'd love to hear from listeners. Well, Robert, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Well, thank you, Robert. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and, of course, to talk about your new book, The Tyranny of Virtue. The Tyranny of Virtue is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. 
Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here's where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and souls. If not me, then who? This ethos is driving the Travis Manion Foundation to empower veterans and families of fallen heroes to develop character in future generations. In 2007, Marine First Lieutenant Travis Manion was killed in Iraq while saving his wounded teammates. Travis's legacy lives on in the five words he spoke before leaving for his final deployment. If not me, then who? Guided by this mantra, veterans continue their service, developing strong relationships in the community and thrive in their post-military lives. Visit TravisManion.org and ensure the character of our nation's heroes lives on in the next generation. If not me, then who? Welcome back to Moments with Mary Ann. Well, I'm so delighted to be introducing our next special guest today, Dr. Stuart Eisendrath. And he's here to share with us his new book, When Antidepressants Aren't Enough, Harnessing the Power of Mindfulness to Alleviate Depression. Now, this book is so impactful. I have actually purchased this book myself for many of my friends and sent them out to them for the holidays. I can't say enough good things about this book. I have one in my personal library. Now, Dr. Eisendrath is the founding director of the University of California, San Francisco Depression Center. He's a senior clinician and research psychiatrist at UCSF. His lectures on mindful-based cognitive therapy for University of California TV has been viewed more than 1.5 million times. So let's welcome to the show, Dr. Stuart Eisendrath. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. What an honor it is to have you here. My goodness, you're one of the leading voices in regards to depression and how people can cure it. I'm so glad we get to spend this time together. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it, too. So why don't you share with us what was the inspiration behind writing this book? Well, the inspiration for the book was really uh, an understanding of depression and what the common treatment of depression has in terms of efficacy. That is, the most common treatment for depression these days are antidepressants. But the important thing about antidepressants is, according to the STAR-D study, which was the largest study ever of the treatment of depression with antidepressants, found that only after uh, 12 weeks of treatment just about one third of people had fully recovered. And if you gave the rest of the people a second course of treatment, only about 50% total had been recovered. So even after two full 12 week treatments, which is actually more than many people get, only 50% had recovered. And that means 50% had not. So it's a challenge to treat people with antidepressants and get full recovery. So we wanted to develop a technique that people could use to enhance their recovery and a skill that they could take with them so they could use that empowerment to gain relief from depression. 
Oh, I think that that is just is so important, especially now it seems like there's so many people suffering from depression. Yes. Uh, depression is the most common illness really in the, in the world. And the world health organization estimates that over a hundred million people suffer from depression and depression is the number one cause of disability in the world. That means there's more disability from depression than there is from coronary artery disease or cancer or any other condition. So if you imagine that, it's a tremendous cause of suffering in the world, larger than any other illness. Wow. That, that's just, uh, the numbers are astounding. And I'm, I really really liked your book when antidepressants aren't enough. It, it teaches people a new life skill that they can use in other areas. And I'd love for you to share with us the alternative that you are using. Well, we developed a study called the practicing alternatives to heal depression. And in that we use the technique called mindfulness based cognitive therapy. It's essentially a mindfulness meditation linked with some aspects of cognitive behavior therapy. And it teaches people a a different way of approaching depression so that they can uh, really be empowered after they finish the course of treatment to do things themselves that they can help control and recover from depression. You know, I was really shocked to reading your book how you know, there are um, certain negative thoughts that could be actually symptoms of depression. And I found that that was really interesting because a lot of times when people think they have negative thoughts, they're not really thinking that they're just thinking, oh, I have a negative mind. They're not thinking, oh, this could be a symptom of depression. That's exactly right. You know, when we think of depression, uh, we commonly think of things like disturbed sleep or change in appetite or lethargy or loss of energy or uh, even suicidal thoughts. Those are all symptoms of depression. But just as much as those thoughts, negative thoughts are also symptoms of depression. In fact, uh, we've cataloged 30 different types of negative thoughts that are most common in depression and <clears throat> they're symptoms of depression. So thoughts like, I'm a bad person, or I'll never succeed, or I'm not as good as somebody else, or I don't deserve to do better. Those types of negative thoughts are symptoms of depression, just like disturbed sleep is. And what's tricky about those thoughts are they tend to cycle back on depression. For example, if you think I'm not a good person, it's natural that that would deepen your depression. And then as you deepen your depression, you have more negative thoughts. So it's a negative spiral of of feeling depressed, then having negative thoughts, and that in turn leading to more depression. And what mindfulness-based cognitive therapy does is break up that cycle. It breaks up that spiral so that a person can unlink the thoughts and their depressed mood. Well, I'm glad we're talking about this because there was a lot of stuff I learned about in your book, especially that depression isn't a one-time event. And I was surprised by that. Yes, depression is uh, very commonly a recurring illness. So that if a person has one episode of depression, there's a 90% chance that they'll have another episode of depression within 10 years. If they've had three episodes of depression, there's a 90% chance that they'll have another episode within three years. So it's a recurrent illness. And that's important from several reasons. One is uh, that when it recurs, just like, for example, somebody who has asthma, If you have asthma, you're going to have episodes recur throughout your life. It's rare to so-called cure asthma, but it's expected that there's going to be exacerbations from time to time. And the same thing is true with 
depression. If you have depression as an illness, it's very likely you're going to have a recurrence or a relapse, as we say. And that's important to know because instead of being critical of yourself for saying, oh, here I am again, I'm no good because I have another episode, you can shift and see it as, okay, I'm having a relapse, but that's common in depression. I can get over it. And if I have the tools to get over it, I can do it even faster than just waiting it out. So a person can learn to be more compassionate towards themselves when they have a relapse. And the other important issue about relapse occurring is that mindfulness-based cognitive therapy was first developed as a relapse prevention strategy. So that if you if you complete the training with mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, it can actually diminish the relapse. For example, in one study where it took people who had had an antidepressant and had fully recovered and then gave them mindfulness-based cognitive therapy or to let them go, on the other hand, with usual treatment. So 50% had the mindfulness training and 50% didn't. And it found that in those who had the mindfulness training, the relapse rate was about half of the ones who had not had the training. And in another study, which was even larger, the study took people who had recovered with antidepressant treatment and then again divided them into two groups. One group was maintained on antidepressants, which is the standard treatment. And the other group got training in mindfulness and then were tapered off of their antidepressants. And after two years of follow-up, the rate of relapse was just as good in the people who got mindfulness training as those who had been maintained on antidepressants. And this is an important trial because it showed that mindfulness training could be just as good, and it benefited the people because they were off of antidepressants and didn't have the side effects of antidepressants, such as weight gain or sexual difficulties or uh, abnormal uh, laboratory results. So it was a very major study showing that mindfulness training can be very powerful and can match, and in some cases, do even better than people who are maintained on antidepressants. Well, I know it says that you have been treating people for over 40 years in regards to this. At what point did you become interested in bringing in the mindfulness component into your work? Well, I became very interested in it because I suffered myself from some depressive episodes, and I wanted to learn a technique that I could apply myself Uh, to have better control over depression. And I actually took a mindfulness training course, and I was uncertain of how helpful it would be, but I found it was extremely helpful. It was so amazing that I actually took, took it over for a second time and learned even more of the techniques. And about this time, mindfulness based cognitive therapy was just getting started, and I became involved in that program and in developing it for treating people with depression. And I developed a study uh, that that was funded by the National Institutes of Health and actually demonstrated that mindfulness-based cognitive therapy could help even in people who were on two, who had had two or more antidepressant trials. That was the requirement for getting into the study, even for those people, mindfulness training helped decrease depressive symptoms and promote uh, full recovery. So I myself had a wonderful experience learning mindfulness techniques, and I wanted to help others gain that same tool. Well, thank you for sharing that. My goodness, you've made such an impact in the world doing the work that you're doing. And you have a um, depression center at the University of California, San Francisco, right? That's correct. We started a depression center at UCSF about 20 years ago. 
And the idea of it was to bring together techniques that could help people rather than have people uh, just get routine techniques. We wanted to teach them the latest techniques that could produce the highest level of response and recovery so that that we had experts in depression treatment who would be available to harness these techniques and help the most people. So when we look at, you know, using mindfulness as an approach, what are some of the different activities that people can do using mindfulness? Well, people can learn uh, specific techniques of mindfulness. And in my book, When Antidepressants Aren't Enough, if you go to my website, uh, www.stuarteisendrath.com, you can actually access uh, a host of different med- audio meditations, and you can either stream them or download them for free. And those techniques are all relatively short. They range from three minutes to 10 minutes, and they people can listen to them and follow along with those meditations and learn specific techniques. Those are what we call discrete episodes of meditation. So it's a certain amount of time that you focus on different things, such as your breath or on your body sensations or other things as well, different images. And that's discrete meditation. You can also learn what we call dispositional meditation. And that means you learn how to apply meditation in your everyday life. So, for example, while you're walking, you can learn to pay attention to the sensations you're experiencing in in your legs and feet. And once you start doing that, it's really remarkable what's going on as you walk. You can feel the heel strike of one foot and then your foot moving forward and launching from that foot, from the toes and the ball of your foot, while the other foot rises in a similar pattern. So you can really become aware of what's happening as you're walking. It doesn't require any extra time. It just requires focusing your attention. And whether you're doing a a discrete meditation or dispositional mindfulness, it really focuses on paying attention to something specific, whether it's body sensations or your breath or something else. It's focusing your attention. And one thing that's important to understand is when you focus your attention, your mind will naturally wander. That's what our minds do. And the idea here is to not be critical of yourself. Oh, my mind wandered. I'm not doing it right. To rather say, oh, my mind wandered. There it goes again. And then gently and kindly bring the attention back to your focus, such as the breath. And by training your mind, to focus on one thing, you gain greater control over it and become more proficient in learning mindfulness skills. So that's how the mindfulness skills really help people control their depression overall is by controlling their thoughts? Well, not exactly controlling their thoughts, but learning how much attention they pay to their thoughts. For example, if I my when my mind wanders to I'm not I, I I'm a bad person. Uh, several things about that. One is uh, understanding when you have have the idea I'm a bad person. You realize that's a thought. It's a thought that I'm a bad person. And then if you're uh, doing a meditation, a mindfulness meditation and you're focusing on the breath, and your mind wanders to the thought, I'm a bad person, you can gently and kindly bring your attention back to the breath. So you're learning to, in effect, let those thoughts go. And they don't stop coming necessarily, but you don't have to pay so much attention to them. They can fade into the background, so it may be kind of like turning down the volume on a radio. The radio is still on, 
but it isn't the center of your attention. You can go on with your goals and values in your life without being stuck paying so much attention to the negative thoughts. It really sounds like you're teaching people life skills that they've never learned that they can use for multiple different things aside of depression. Because we look at, you know, is this something that could be used for anxiety, for example? Exactly. I look at anxiety and depression as really disorders of time regulation. In depression, the person feels as if a loss has occurred. That means a loss of a loved one, a loss of a job, the loss of some financial assets, whatever the loss might be, the person feels, whether or not it's true, they feel a loss has occurred and they feel depressed. In anxiety, they feel that a loss is going to occur. They think a loss is going to take place in the future, and they're very anxious about that. And what mindfulness does is bring them to the present moment. So if you're focusing on your breath, you're not involved with the past. You're not involved with the future. Your, your, your mind's bandwidth, if you will, is focused on the present moment. If I'm focusing on my breath, I'm not paying attention to the past. If I'm focusing on my breath in the present moment, I'm not paying attention to some catastrophe catastrophe that I might be imagining happening in the future. And it isn't that those things disappear, but the attention to them shifts. For example, one woman came into our one of our training groups and came in with the expectation she'd never be anxious again. And she had three children, and she was very anxious about them. Whenever they weren't around, she'd have anxious thoughts about them. If her son was out on a Saturday night, she'd imagine him getting into a car accident and being disabled or some other kind of disaster happening. And she was hoping that she would never have those thoughts again. Well, that's not really realistic. That's not the way anxiety tends to work. But as by the last week of the eight week training, she realized those thoughts would occur but she could let them go and bring her attention back to the breath or whatever else she was focusing on in the present moment. It might be the breath. It might be body sensation. It might be chopping vegetables for her dinner. She, if, if she was focusing on the breath, she wasn't catastrophizing. She wasn't worried about what had happened. It faded just like the volume being turned down on the radio so that she was able to go on with her life and not be critical of herself for having these kinds of catastrophizing thoughts, but realize that she didn't have to buy into those thoughts. That seems like such a big piece is that self-critic that comes in. You know, when, when you talk about depression from reading your book, it's these negative thoughts and this negative impact that keeps coming back and coming up. And it's kind of that cycle you were talking about. That's exactly right. If Part of mindfulness is learning how to be compassionate with yourself. One fellow in a group said, you know, I guess if I can forgive myself for my mind wandering, I can forgive myself for other things too. And self-compassion can be a, like a lens that you use to view yourself and compassion towards others as well. For example, if your mind wanders, you could say, what a, what a bad meditator I am. But if you apply compassion to it, you realize that there's a sense of commonality with other people. Like my mind wandered, well, so what? That's what minds tend to do. I can bring my attention back and my mind wanders again recognize that's just what people do. And I'm just like other people. In fact, that's a good exercise to try. When you're at a stoplight, looking over at a person next to you, you can say to yourself, they're just like me. They have the same desires and thoughts. They're just like me. And you could help that helps you experience the common humanity that you have 
rather than the isolation and self-criticism that you can bring to the situation when you're depressed. So when self-compassion is being developed and we're doing these daily practices, is there a point where a person can start to feel that level of happiness again? And does it take a long time to get there? Well, <clears throat> the program is designed to uh, go for eight weeks. And what we've found is that after about four weeks, people start to really get the concepts and uh, their levels of self-compassion, which we measured, their level of depression, the self-compassion increases, their depression and anxiety levels decrease, and their tendency to ruminate decreases. So instead of being critical of yourself, instead of saying, I should have done this, I should have done that, I should have said this, I should have responded differently, instead of being stuck in an endless loop of rumination, that stops or diminishes. And the person is able to feel happier and more joy in their life. And so it takes anywhere between four and eight weeks to really start to get the concepts and be able to apply them in your everyday life. But of course, some people, there's some variability. Some people may get the concepts even after one or two sessions. So it all depends on the individual. When we talked about anxiety, are there other kind of roadblocks, you know, preventing people to get to a place of happiness? And if so, how do they overcome those? Well, one of the most important ways uh, to overcome them is to understand a very simple yet very powerful issue. And that is that thoughts are not facts. Many people have the idea, like, for example, I'm a bad person or I'm not as good as others. And they don't realize those are just thoughts. Those are thoughts and not a fact. For example, If you have a table in your room and you see it, you can. The fact is, it's a table. But if you apply an adjective to it, like that's an ugly table, well, that's a thought. You may think it's ugly, I may not, or vice versa. Those are thoughts, not facts. And so, for example, if you think of thoughts in this way, it helps give an idea of what I'm talking about. If you're walking down the street of a town, and there's a whole ring of, of stores with uh, display windows available, and you see a thought in the window, you might go in and purchase that thought. And that thought might be a very negative one. But it, with mindfulness, you learn to see that thought, but not have to go in and buy it. You can learn to keep walking down the street, noticing the thought, but not accepting it as a fact and taking it on. So you still notice those thoughts. They're still there, but you don't have to accept them as facts. That's the important thing. You can learn to what we call decenter from those thoughts and not have to live as if they're a fact. Because if you accept them as a fact, it's very likely you're going to get depressed or get more depressed than you are. If you accept them as just thoughts, you can move on with your life. I think that provides a much happier existence when you make that distinction because then not everything that comes just rambling through our head has to be a truth. It can just be a thought and you can move it on. Exactly. There's a thought. I don't have to accept it. And it may or may not be a fact. I'll have to wait a little bit and observe more to decide whether it's a thought. I mean, for example, If if, uh, you send an email to somebody and they don't respond immediately, you may have the thought, oh, they don't like me anymore, or oh, they're, they're rejecting me. And if you have such a thought, it'd be natural to get depressed or sad about it. But if you say, I have that thought, but I don't have to accept it as a fact, you don't have to get depressed. You may even come up with alternative thoughts, like perhaps they didn't get it. Perhaps it went into their spam mailbox. Perhaps they're having computer trouble. Perhaps they're busy. 
perhaps they didn't see it, all kinds of alternative explanations, and you don't have to get depressed. Well, that lets a lot of people kind of off the hook, and I think gives a lot of hope because it, you can just kind of let that stuff go. You know, it's just stuff that's moving through the mind. Exactly. It moves mm-hmm. through and you don't have to accept it as a fact. You know, in your book, you talk about the difference between pain and suffering. And I'd love for you to share that with our listeners, because I think a lot of times people think that's the same thing. Suffering, we like to think of as being related to the amount of pain a person has, whether it be physical or emotional pain, multiplied by what we call the resistance to that pain. So if you take depression as an example, uh, depression is a very uh, unpleasant uh, feeling. But if you multiply it by different thoughts, uh, resistance, as it were, it actually makes your suffering worse. So, for example, if you say, I'm a bad person because I'm depressed or I'm a bad person because I'm stuck in depression, or I'm a bad person because I'm having uh, another depressive episode, or I should be able to get out of this myself. I, uh, I shouldn't have to rely on others to help me. All of those things actually worsen depression and worsen, worsen the suffering the person has. In other words, you're getting depressed more depressed about being depressed rather than uh, just noticing the depression, observing it, and not adding a judgment to it. For example, if you take a bear uh, in the woods, and Robert Sapolsky, a biologist at Stanford, has studied this kind of thing uh, among animals of different types. If you take a bear in the and, and calls this adventitious suffering, unnecessary suffering. If you take that bear in the woods and it gets a thorn in its foot, it there's a certain amount of pain associated with it. But the bear doesn't think, to the best of our knowledge, I got that thorn in my foot because of my relationship with my mother or because I did something bad or because uh, I'm a bad bear. It just reaches down and tries to pull the thorn out and reduce the pain itself. And that's it doesn't suffer needlessly by adding a judgment to the process. It has pain, but it can do something about it. And that's true of depression as well. If you have depression, it is a painful stimulus, but you don't have to add a negative judgment to it. So if you have depression, let's say I am, I am depressed, I can look at it, if I don't judge it, say, ah, what's causing that depression? What can I do that might be a more skillful response rather than judging myself negatively? Maybe I can change my situation. Maybe I can alter my relationship or change my job or change to a different job. So you learn how to get that thorn out of your paw, so to speak, and be able to move on with your life. Yeah, it's so often people add that whole layer of things to it, thinking it's a personal attack or something dealing with them personally. And it's interesting how much of that gets internalized. Exactly. Exactly. If you if you lose your job because perhaps your company is scaling back and uh, cutting out a layer of employees, if you want to view it depressively, you can say it's because of yourself. If you view it for without that type of judgment, you can notice, ah, this is what's happening, but I can move on. I can try to adapt and be more flexible and move on to something else without a judgment or criticism of yourself. So, Doctor, what would you like listeners and our readers to take away from your book? Well, I'd like them to understand, first of all, that depression is an illness that's very common 
and they don't have to criticize themselves for having it. But they can also learn a technique uh, of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, uh, and it's laid out in the book when mind, when antidepressants aren't enough, so that they can learn over a period of eight weeks how to change their relationship to depression. And this is a powerful technique. We study people's brains you know, over this eight-week period by using functional MRIs to measure their brain function before and after. And we saw definite changes in their brain by eight weeks. So this isn't something that is just sort of smoke and mirrors. This is actually changing how you relate to depression and changing your brain patterns over this same period of time. So it can be very powerful. And in some instances, as I mentioned in that study, comparing antidepressants and this technique, just as powerful as antidepressants. My goodness, doctor, you are making such a huge impact with so many people. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community? The uh, best place would be uh, my website, www.stewarteisendraft.com. And there's a great deal of information there. And uh, of course, the book lays this out in much greater detail. So th- those would be other alternatives. And then, of course, There are often mindfulness-based cognitive therapy groups available in many areas of the country and actually worldwide now. And if you Google up different classes in that, you'll be able to see other uh, places where it's offered as well. Well, I understand also that you have lectures on mindful-based cognitive therapy that have been viewed over 1.5 million times. So listeners can go to your website. They can pick up the book when antidepressants aren't enough and also join your community, be part of that. Dr. Stewart Eisendraft, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you. I've enjoyed being here. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you. And of course, to talk about your new book, When Antidepressants Aren't Enough. Dr. Eisendraft's book is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And if you don't see it on the shelf, ask for them to order it. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.